We're now going to talk about two naturalistic Baroque painters. Uh, both of them are from Rome, Michelangelo da Caravaggio and Artemisia Gentileschi. Now, with a name like Michelangelo da Caravaggio, it's Michelangelo, named for St. Michael the Archangel, from Caravaggio. And so you have this famous painter named Michelangelo. Uh, the name has been taken. And although Michelangelo Buenarote actually does have a last name, we really don't refer to him as Buenarote. Uh, the 16th century great artist is uh, always referred to by his first name, uh, Michelangelo or Michelangelo Buenarote. So with Caravaggio, Caravaggio is the little town from which he comes. So unlike Leonardo, I'm going to allow you to use Caravaggio as his name because that is who he is recognized. Uh, that's, that is the name that is used in art history. So he is uh, going to be Caravaggio. Now, Caravaggio is one of these very innovative artists. And in the 1590s, he decides uh, that he does not like mannerism at all. It's about as far from what his type of art is as you can get. He feels that art should be completely natural. And this can include even figures that are ugly or unidealized. So it's a complete contrast to what Karachi is doing with his idealized uh, forms and figures that you know, hark back to classical antiquity and the Renaissance, Caravaggio will even show you saints as ordinary or even maybe below ordinary uh, people. So we're going to see that. Uh, and that's one of the remarkable things. He will show you ordinary people. Uh, this is a painting of St. Matthew writing the Gospels. It's not in your text, but I want to talk to you about it because I want to make a point with it. Uh, and the painting, I cannot show you the painting in color because the painting no longer exists. It was in Dresden during the firebombing of Dresden in the Second World War. And there were great losses in the art museums as well as loss of life and other things. Uh, and this painting was destroyed. There were photographs, but only black and white photographs. So this is what we're going to show you. Caravaggio had a commission for this, and it was supposed to be uh, for the, uh, the uh, French Fr Franciscans uh, in uh, the church of uh, San Luigi dei Francesi, Franceschi. And he painted this to go over the high altar. This is the first St. Matthew. When the monks saw it, they were not having any of it. They did not like this painting. They rejected it. And they made uh, Caravaggio paint a second painting. Uh, fortunately for Caravaggio, uh, someone else bought it immediately. <laughs> um, but what are their objections? Certainly the angel is very, very beautiful. The angel is a symbol of St. Matthew. Uh, and here it's used to show divine inspiration, uh, that she's literally guiding his hand as he writes the Gospels. But maybe that's kind of the problem. Because this saint looks like he could be mucking out stables. Actually, he looks like he'd be a good model for Socrates, but uh, they didn't see it or think it. Uh, they objected to the fact that he looked like he was kind of a very low-life guy, as I say, somebody who'd been mucking out the stables. Um, and they also objected to the cross legs and the dirty feet. Now, notice the foot. The foot is foreshortened. It appears to extend outward over what? The altar. Now, the sources don't tell you this, but I have a pretty good idea why that, one reason why that would be so upsetting. If any of you uh, are Catholic or have been to a Catholic church, uh, you know that 
the altar the painting could be placed on an altarpiece but you could also have perhaps a tabernacle of the sacrament in other words a little recessed area where you place the consecrated host now i don't know if this chapel uh, i don't remember whether I've, I've been there once but i don't remember whether it had a little red light on and that means there's a consecrated host uh there um but if they did that, you would actually have this dirty foot extending over the host. It would seem very, real, almost blasphemous. Uh, certainly, it would seem indecorous. And remember, art must be decorous. It must be appropriate to the subject. And if you think about it, Matthew was not an illiterate. And here he's shown as though he can't, does, barely knows his ABCs, you know, like he can barely write. Uh, he's just puzzling it out as the angel pushes the hand. Well, that says that it has to be the word of God because this guy couldn't have come up with it. He's just too dumb, illiterate. But that wasn't St. Matthew. St. Matthew was originally named Levi, and he was a tax collector. So he would have definitely had to read, write, and figure, and tax collectors became quite wealthy men. Uh, so he would have been a, certainly a literate uh, man. So it's not very accurate either according to the biblical story. But it does give you that idea that even somebody who's not very you know, prepossessing uh, by some people's standards could be a saint. Okay, so we had to paint a second version. And this is what the second version looks like. Uh, it's still very naturalistic, but the saint now looks more like a sage, like a wise man, uh, a very naturalistic evangelist writing, his, writing for himself. He's perfectly literate. He can write the gospel. But he is still receiving divine inspiration. And you'll notice that he looks up to a flying angel who seems to be counting out points on his fingers. And I always assume he's doing the uh, genealogy of Christ and uh, going through each part. That is the very beginning of the Gospel of St. Matthew. Now, this one was accepted. The foot might be dirty. Who can tell? The foot is parallel to the picture plane. It doesn't extend out to the viewer. Uh, the leg is well wrapped in a, uh, I, I call them amorphous biblical robes. Uh, sort of something between, he's got a tunic underneath and a, a drapery around him. Uh, and even has a, a little subtle halo. Uh, this is just me. I don't know whether anybody has said this or not, but I kind of wonder if he got back a little at him because you might notice the face of the angel. It does not have the sublime beauty of the original angel. Uh, Matthew may be more decorous, uh, but the angel looks like he's kind of a street urchin. And uh, this particular person served as a model uh, in uh, Caravaggio's studio. So uh, they evidently didn't notice that. So the second version is much more decorous as appropriate for a Counter-Reformation work. By this time I'm saying Counter-Reformation in the sense of being in that period, in this case the 17th century. Uh, it doesn't have anything to say about Protestants. You're now looking at the Contarelli Chapel in the Church of San Luigi dei Franceschi in Rome. And this is the chapel that contains three paintings by Caravaggio on the subject of St. Matthew. Uh, we're going to look at the calling of St. Matthew. We've already looked at St. Matthew writing the Gospels, which is over the altar. And then the third picture, which we are not going to look at, uh, is uh, the martyrdom of St. Matthew. This is Caravaggio's calling of St. Matthew, or the conversion of St. Matthew, if you prefer. A good date to use for this picture, and for uh, Caravaggio in general, is circa, C period, uh, 1600, because as you can see, he began it in uh, 1599 and uh, finished it uh, early year of the 1600s. It tells us a story from the Bible. The story is told in three of the four Gospels. In the Gospel of St. Matthew, chapter 9, verse 9, in Mark 2, 14, and in Luke 5, verses 27 to 28. So you can go look it up, because uh, I do tend to embellish uh, when I'm uh, explaining these things. 
The story is a story of a tax collector whose name is Levi. And uh, when he is converted, uh, he takes on the new name of Matthew. Uh, but the tax collector is called to be Christ's disciple. Now, tax collectors have never been very popular, but uh, in ancient Judea, they were despised uh, because they were collaborators with Rome. The Hebrew people were under the Roman rule, and they did not like it. Uh, they wanted to throw off the hated Romans. And so anyone who was uh, Jewish and collaborating with the enemy uh, would be particularly despised. And that's what a tax collector did. Uh, Rome, the emperor, essentially, uh, tells the tax collector how much money he has to collect. Anything more? That's gravy. That's his salary. So he's kind of an extortionist as well. Um, nobody liked tax collectors. And here Jesus goes in and says to him, follow me. You know, come and be my disciple. Come and follow me. Give up all your worldly earnings and just go wandering around with this wandering rabbi. Amazing. And lo and behold, Matthew does. Now, when you look at this picture, it almost looks like a kind of tavern scene, uh, except they've got money that they're counting out uh, rather than uh, uh, drinks on the table. Uh, but it's, it's kind of a dark room. And this is a sort of slice of life. Uh, if you look at uh, Peter and Christ, they're wearing, once again, what I call the amorphous biblical robes, uh, sort of a tunic with a, a uh, length of cloth wrapped around them. Uh, and then you look at the people at the table, and they're wearing, well, what are archaic clothing, but it's like maybe 30 years before. It's not exactly 1600. So their clothing's a little out of date. It's, it's saying earlier time, in a sense. Uh, and it gives you a feeling that these are just sort of, uh, what, uh, everyday people, uh, greedy, because they're really fascinated with the money, uh, but sort of low life. And what we're seeing is essentially a slice of life. And the Baroque does this very often, where they'll show a scene as though it's happening just in a moment and things can change the next minute. Uh, sort of like a snapshot. And for example, there is Jesus with his arm outstretched and it looks like St. Peter just walked through the door and walked right in front of him. Have you ever had someone do that? You're taking a snapshot of someone and someone walks right in front of you. That's what it looks like. Of course, if you look a little carefully, uh, as we'll see in a minute, uh, the real important parts of Jesus are showing his face and his hands. Uh, it's a very dark room. And it's kind of an asymmetrical composition. You know, the, the main figures are on one side, uh, standing upright. And then you have a lot of other figures seated on the other side. Uh, and in a sense, the weight is also carried because the top upper right as we look at it, uh, part has light. And it seems to be coming from a hidden window and shedding a diagonal shaft of light as it comes down and illuminates the face of Matthew and his cronies. And here we see Jude, uh, Jesus is half hidden behind Peter uh, but as I said, you can see his hands and you can see his face. And those are the important parts that tell what he's doing, essentially tell the story. Um, Christ's gesture extends out. And you'll often find books telling you that this is a gesture from Michelangelo's Sistine Chapel ceiling. But it's more like the gesture of Adam than the gesture of God. Now, I'm going to tell you what my professor told me. You know, like... Don't know whether it's so or not. Uh, but he said that this gesture, although it certainly reminds us of the Michelangelo gesture, um, is actually a beckoning gesture in Italy. 
And, you know, in the United States, I mean, you probably wouldn't do this. It would be just too rude. But if you wanted to call somebody over and you were sort of looking down at them, as you know, you might uh, take, your, take your palm up and uh, put your three fingers down and have your thumb up and your finger up and you beckon with that thumb. You bend that, I mean, you beckon with that forefinger. You know, come here, come here, you over there, you boy, you know, <laughs> come here. Um, probably pretty rude. Well, the similar gesture would be in Italy, I'm told, uh, is that the hand is down and the uh, fingers are brought back toward the palm. So, come, come, come over here. So he said, you know, he's, he's interesting. come here, here, boy, come on. <laughs> so he really is calling him with his hand. Um, and there you see the gesture that, uh, Christ's gesture that looks like uh, the gesture in the creation of Adam. Uh, but it seems odd to me that it is uh, Adam's gesture rather than God the Father's, uh, or closer to God the Father's, because the fingers are down. Here is a term that I want you to know. It's tenebroso, which is the Italian adjective, or tenebrism, which is taking that adjective and giving it uh, an English ending and making it into a uh, noun. Uh, tenebroso means shadowy. And it's the type of lighting that you see uh, when you have a predominantly dark composition, like this one, and then the light shines in. Sort of a light in a dark world. And you'll remember from other works of art that we've talked about, whether it's uh, light shining on St. Francis in Bellini's uh, Ecstasy of, of St. Francis, or whether it's the actual light of the sun, uh, as in Bernini's uh, Santa Teresa. Well, here we have a painting of natural light coming from a hidden window, coming down, and as I said, it's shining right to Matthew and illuminating his face. Uh, and it seems as though it's the natural light here stands for spiritual light or spiritual illumination. Uh, he's, he's becoming aware. And he was, he's pointing to himself and saying, who? Me? What? You know, he just you know, can't believe that Jesus is calling him, but he is. So here is a perfect example of tenebroso or shadowy uh, when you have the light in the dark world.